In this week's final motor week of the current series, Richard Hammond jets off to the home of Citroen for an exclusive first drive of the all-new C3. Ian Royal gives us a blast from the past when his used car tip is the Morris Minor. Plus, there's a whole lot more. For years, Citroen enjoyed a reputation as the crazy mad professors of the motoring world. They made idiosyncratic cars with odd features. Things like hydropneumatic suspension that meant your family car could bob up and down like a space hopper. Indicators that didn't self-cancel. Odd, wacky stuff, and we loved them for it. Only thing is, we didn't buy their cars. Then they went more mainstream with things like Saxo and Zara. We bought them, but they're not very interesting. But now, Citroen claim that they've allowed their crazy little streak off the leash with this, the C3. Make no mistake, the C3 differs from the Saxo in many ways. For a start, it has absolutely no sporting pretensions, so don't expect there to be a hot VTS or VTR version just around the corner. And then there's the engine choices. The entry-level Saxo is pushed along by a rather humble little one-litre unit. In the UK, the base-level C3 will be powered by a rather more challenging and exciting 1.4-litre, or you could opt to go for the 1.6-litre petrol or the 1.4-litre HDI diesel. And then there's pricing. You can get a Saxo for about 20, 25 quid. The entry level C3 in the UK will cost you more like around nine grand. But enough about what it isn't. What about some of the things that it is? It does feel pretty impressively large in here for what is, remember, a Fiesta class car. The seats have been raised slightly higher than usual, which adds to that feeling of scale and importance. And there's loads of glass, so it's light and airy. And for the interior, I do like touches like the nice dimply plastic, it's unusual. And I like the fact that it manages to recapture that kind of rugged, practical and yet stylish appearance that the French have always been so good at. And then there's the outside. Where I reckon, anyway, it manages to pull off the difficult trick of looking both cutesy and sweet and nice, but still substantial. It doesn't look flimsy like, say, ooh, a 2CV. Citroen have given their newcomer curves in place of straight lines, and they've not been shy about making it look cute. It's probably not going to be a big hit with the boy racer brigade, this one. Anyone driving it with their cap on backwards will be doing so strictly to keep the sun off the back of their neck. Well, Julian Layton is from Citroen, and Julian, this is then very much a lifestyle car, that's what it's about. Absolutely. Uh, more than ever before, Citroen today is producing cars that not only people want to buy, but really do cater for their lifestyle needs. But you've got to be careful, because in your range, the Saxo, which was the big one for you, it really put you on the map in the UK, um, you've got to make sure this doesn't tread on that's toes. It's got quite a, a loyal following. V very definitely so, and, and that's exactly what we're intending to do. Um, the Saxo is our true small car. This is significantly bigger than the Saxo, um, and it comes into the range between Saxo and the Zara and if you look back over the last decade or so many manufacturers have split that small car range into two um, if we look at Peugeot with the 106 and the 206 or Ford car and Fiesta that's what we're now able to do with the C3 complementing the Saxo and not treading on its toes um, for example the Saxo the sporty Saxo sell particularly well the C3 does not have any delusions about sportiness it's a small family car now, Julian, I know that Citroen UK don't make predictions about volume, about how many you're going to sell, so I shan't put you on the spot. But how many are you going to sell? <laughs> as many as we possibly can. It's, uh, it's a, a sector that we, we are strong in, as you said, with small cars. We've sold well with the Saxo. The Picasso, as we mentioned just now, became the best-selling MPV in the UK last year. So that for Saxo, we, uh, with, sorry, with, together with Saxo, the C3 will give us a very strong presence in that small car segment. This is, of course, very much a city car, so it's perhaps a bit unfair to hurl it along your favourite stretch of country lane. That said, if you do decide to press on, it'll cope quite nicely, and there's certainly no unpleasant quirks or traits waiting to be discovered. This example that we have here is the 1.6-litre petrol engine version, and it's no firecracker, but it is, well, I hate to use the word, but it is adequate. More than adequate, maybe. 
The Saxo paved the way to make Citroen a mainstream manufacturer in the UK. The C3 is now shouldered with the responsibility of making them interesting as well. Good luck. Ah, the fine English countryside, and this week's One Careful Owner epitomises everything there is to say about Britain. This is the sort of car that a little old lady would drive around a quaint English country village, dropping off to see the vicar along the way, delivering freshly baked scones to her friends. If Agatha Christie's Miss Marple drove a car, she would drive a Morris Minor. And there are plenty of pitfalls to beware of if you fancy a classic Morris Minor like this. Now, as you can see, this is one of the two-door coupes. This was built in 1971, was probably one of the last ever produced because production stopped in 1971. It started way back in 1948. Yes, the Minor was around for such a long time. Now, it doesn't look cosmetically brilliant, this car, certainly not in terms of the paintwork, but underneath, this is very, very sound. It needs one or two little bits doing to it, but there are lots of things to watch out for if you fancy buying a classic Miner. And the first thing you notice inside the engine bay is how small the actual engine is. It's tiny, certainly compared to modern day engines, it only takes up about half the space inside there. But it's a very reliable 1000cc unit. It will run and run and run for thousands of miles without too much worry or too much expense. But rust can be a big problem on these cars. Check around inside the engine bay particularly. It's bad in here. There's one or two little bits and bobs inside here which would need attention. Get underneath and check the front chassis legs and the floor pan as well. But basically, this is a sound car with a complete respray. This could be a very, very nice classic Miner. Now, the Morris Miner is a very simple car with its monocoque design and independent front suspension. As you can see from this panel here, it's obviously had some work done to it over the years. The paint is not fantastic, but I reckon about £500 to completely respray this car will have it in pretty much pristine condition. Have a good old feel and tap around the panels for any signs of damage and rust around there, particularly under the wheel arches and also the sills around the door. Underneath there and inside here, problem areas. And as for the boot space, well, it's, um, it's not huge as you can see, but ideal for a shopping trip. As you can imagine, the Morris Minor compared to modern day cars is very, very basic and very, very simple. You sit in a seat that doesn't adjust, so you're either comfortable or uncomfortable. And for me, it's the latter of those, to be perfectly honest. There are very few switches in the car. Lights, there's the choke, there's the indicators and the windscreen wipers, and that's it. And this huge, huge steering wheel absolutely enormous. I don't think I've ever driven a car with such a big steering wheel. Feels like it belongs to a truck instead. And as for speed on this, well, leisurely is the best way to describe it, to be honest. We're doing 30 miles an hour. I'd like to go to about 40. Beyond that, probably not. I've got to be honest and say that this isn't the sort of car I want to travel huge distances in. Ideal for maybe just nipping around town and popping to the shops and doing the chores. And if you want a classic car, this sort of Morris Minor might be ideal for you. You can pay anything from £50 to £500 for a Morris Minor in poor condition. But if you want a nice car that's already been restored and is well looked after, these are the sort of prices you're going to have to pay. For a Series 2 estate, around £2,100. For a Series 2 convertible, £2,800. For a Morris Minor saloon, £2,100. For the commercial van, about £1,850. Now those are for cars in average condition. Immaculate cars will cost even more. Buying a Morris Minor is not exactly an inexpensive option. Sure, they're cheap to run and insure, and most cars don't need taxing either. But I think you need to spend around £2,500 to find a really nice example. And you'd have to be a real die-hard Morris Minor fan to spend your hard-earned cash on that, I suspect. Me, 
I like my creature comforts a bit too much. After the break, Richard drives the new Super Duper Supercharged Cooper. Plus, we drive the weird and wonderful Renault Velsatis. See you soon. There are faster cars out there. There are certainly smaller cars and there are certainly cheaper cars. But when it comes to offering a package that gives you outstanding funky street cred, enough performance to make you smile, a kind of heritage even if only in the name, and certainly excellent build quality, I think the new Mini Cooper S is fantastic. So let's not think of it as being expensive. Let's think of it as being reassuringly expensive. <laughs> Now, some say it's bad journalistic practice to open a feature like this with your conclusions. You're supposed to tease, cajole and amuse your viewer, listener or reader and take them with you on an entertaining and informative voyage of discovery. Ideally, you should open with one viewpoint, gradually prove it wrong and close with entirely different conclusions. Well, bugger that, this seems fab and I'm not about to say otherwise. The new Mini Cooper S is as cute, stylish and adorable as the rest of the Mini range, but with more of everything thrown in. More umph, more scoops, more spoilers, more style, even more gears. I like the new Mini, and so do lots of other people, and if you're amongst them, you are gonna love this. Now let's calm down here and take an anorak moment to consider just what has changed for the Mini Cooper S. Overall, it looks even more squat, purposeful and aggressive, but without ever stopping looking cute. It has gained chrome touches all over the place, a rear roof spoiler, new front grille and best of all, a great big intake scoop on the bonnet. And that is a clue, because it's not there just for cosmetic reasons only. Trouser worryingly good, though it looks because the big changes are underneath. It gains a supercharger and intercooler, hence the bulging bonnet. That pushes power up to 163 brake horsepower and brings the 0 to 62 miles an hour time down to 7.4 seconds. The suspension is retuned as well and they even chuck in a six speed gearbox. Thank you. It's not like a turbo where you dawdle along and then there's a terrifying tidal wave of, of power all of a sudden. With the supercharger, it's just constant drive. You can row it through the six gears and just enjoy that huge amount of torque. It is tremendous fun and it does sound fantastic. Of course, this is a Mini, so whilst the bonnet scoop and techie touches might all be genuine and in the name of performance, it doesn't forget the poseurs amongst us. For instance, there is that noise. Mmm. Whether you're abusing your favourite section of country twisties, posing the Saturday high street, soaking up that glorious sound or just staring at it on your drive, the Mini Cooper S has been built to press all the right buttons inside of a lot of people. The original Mini Cooper hit the streets in 1961 and was hugely well received. Small it may have been, but it was the chosen chariot of some pretty big names. Some say that the new Mini isn't Mini enough to bear the name anymore. I say that it was the original car's charm, perky good looks, individuality and hugely enjoyable performance that made it a winner. And I don't see any of those things lacking here at all. The old Mini was bouncy, cramped and frighteningly flimsy if you binned it. It just wouldn't be acceptable today. This though is enormous fun to drive, look at and listen to. The extra oomph gives it the edge over most hot hatches and those looks put it ahead of cars costing twice as much. Of course the price, £14,500 to you in standard form and that is before you add anything like air conditioning, leather seats or larger 17 inch alloy wheels. Once that's done you can expect to be spending £17,000 or even £18,000 pounds on your Mini Cooper S. Right, now where did we start this? Oh yes, <clears throat> there may be faster cars, there may be smaller cars and there are most certainly cheaper cars, but when it comes to offering an all-round package that gives you funky street cred and good looks, enough performance to make you smile, certainly. A kind of heritage, even if only the name, and excellent build quality. The Mini Cooper S is, I think, fantastic. So let's not think of it as being expensive, let's think of it as being reassuringly expensive.
Now you're probably thinking, what on earth's going on here? Paul sat behind a steering wheel. Well, yes I am, and I normally sit behind a pair of handlebars because yes, I ride motorbikes. But they said to me, Paul, get yourself over to sunny Spain and go and have a play in some cars. So we're here at Valencia. This is the Grand Prix circuit, and it's full of Formula One trucks at the moment. It's a fantastic sight. But we're not here to test the cars. We're here to test the tires because they're all fitted with a brand new range of tires from Cooper Avon and they're called the ZZ3. Now it's all very well thrashing a car around the track all day, but that's not how you develop a new tyre. It's very, very technical, believe me. And Marcus Hancock here, my mate, is the senior design engineer. Is that right, Marcus? That's correct. It's a good title, that. Now, I know one of the things you tried to achieve with this is to make, make it quieter, less road noise. How on earth do you do that? OK, well, the pattern is divided into um, tread blocks, and each block we call a pitch. And in there you can see you've got a large pitch and you've got a small pitch and we have other size pitches in there as well. And to make a tyre quiet, you have to scramble those pitches. Now, welcome to the uh, Valencia outdoor swimming pool. Not very deep, is it? No, I'm joking. This is a wet weather testing facility. Spray water over it, and it's a skid pan, basically. Now, it's OK saying, there's a new tyre. Go and see if it's any good. It'll stop you dead quick in the wet if you've nothing to compare it to. So what they've done, quite logically, really, is they've fitted one car, this silver car, with the old tyre, the ZZ1. And they've got the dark-coloured car. That's fitted with the new ZZ3. And the idea is you can see and you can feel the difference. Much better stopping in the wet. So let's see if it works. OK, let's see if there is a difference. I've driven the silver one, and I know I've got a mental note of where I stopped, so I'm doing about 35 mile an hour now, and I'm going to anchor up here. And I've stopped there. And I stopped over there before. Amazing! It works! Wow! Now, if you want to know about a brand new product, you ask the man who designed it. And this is him, Paul Sketzler, tyre designer. So, Paul, what qualities have you tried to put into this brand new tyre? The brief from the marketing department was to produce a tyre which had very good handling performance in the dry, but also exceptional wet performance for wet braking and wet handling. And I think if you talk to anybody who's tried the product here today, they'll vouch for that, and that's what we've achieved. Things have obviously gone pretty well for whoever ends up actually living in a house like this. A place so stylish there's a force field at the door to stop people like me from getting in. And not surprisingly, it is stashed full of seriously stylish stuff. Things that I can't tell the difference if they're objets d'art or kitchen implements, frankly. So you would expect there to be something a bit special and stylish in the garage. Well, there is. <laughs> a long hard look at the whole luxury car market and decided that their best option was to make a car unlike anything else. And boy have they. Now it will be available with this 2 litre turbo petrol engine or a V6 turbo diesel or more interestingly still a 3.5 litre V6 petrol. That's the one I'm going for. Renault have decided that the biggest luxury a car can afford us isn't just the bells and whistles and gizmos. It's space, so they've equipped the Velsatis with tons of it, and it is enormous in here. There is so much headroom. And it's not just the physical space that makes it feel big in here either. There's loads of glass, and it's lightly coloured, so it feels light, bright and airy. The Velsatis' biggest, biggest trick, though, is this interior. Because, by comparison, think about it, cars like Mercedes, BMW, even some Audi, the usual luxury cars, feel a bit gloomy. It's just that bit different. It's a bit more like sitting in a very stylish living room. With this 3.5 litre V6 engine version, it'll go from 0 to 60 in 8.3 seconds, which is not bad for something this big. But don't be under any illusion that this is a sports car, because clearly it's not. It's a luxury car. And to hustle it through bends at too quick a pace would be, well, frankly, undignified. 
Usually, interior designers chuck in the odd bauble, maybe one or two interesting features for us to talk about. I don't know, a nice clock, a drawer. But in here, they've done just about everything. We've got little marquetry inset panels on the veneer. We've got cupboards and drawers opening all over the place. There's more storage than you'd find in a house. There is the obligatory, rather elegant clock, but also the stereo. Even the stereo is a piece of designer artwork. Technically, well, there's probably nothing that special. The 3.5 litre V6 is a new engine for them, and the V6 turbo diesel is a bit unusual and a very good drive. Other than that, the rear suspension's a bit clever, but that's more because of the body shape than anything else. You have a choice of a six-speed manual or a five-speed automatic proactive gearbox, and that's about it. Underneath, it's fairly standard stuff. Take a good long look, because this is probably the first and last time you'll see more than one of these at any one time. That's because Renault are being very clever. They're going to be strictly controlling and limiting the numbers. That'll keep the Valsartis as rare and exclusive as it actually looks. But it'll also mean if you did buy one, you shouldn't lose a packet, which is often a problem at this end of the market. And let's face it, if you did buy one, one thing you've most certainly bought is a very alternative luxury car.